Hereby, I open this academic ceremony in which Matthias Müller will defend the academic thesis entitled Transparent Enforcement, Access to Information Related to the Monitoring of EU Environmental Law, the case of the EU Emissions Trading System. May I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Thank you very much, Prorector dear members of the assessment committee, dear colleagues, dear family and friends. Traditionally, the enforcement of environmental law has always been carried out by governmental authorities. However, since the 1980s, we can observe that more and more of these enforcement tasks are carried out by, public, uh, by private authorities. They are out, public authorities outsource these enforcement activities to these private authorities. Uh, private entities. One example in the area of EU environmental law is the emissions trading system. Uh, and I want to give you a little introduction to the system so that you better understand what I'm talking about. The EU ETS, the abbreviation for emissions trading system, is a so-called cap and trade system. That means that the regulator sets an overall cap on all emissions that can be emitted by all the participating industries. And this overall cap is then divided into what we call allowances. And one allowance gives the, gives the uh, holder of the allowance the right to emit one ton of CO2. Um, and the participating industries have to buy these allowances as, at auctions, or they can buy and sell them to and from each other. So that means these allowances are tradable. Um, so at the end of uh, one year, each industry has to surrender these allowances and thereby pay for what they emitted. And the tradability makes it very flexible because one industry can choose to reduce its emissions if it's cheaper for, than buying allowances, while other industries can choose to buy allowances from other industries when that's more favorable for them. And this overall system ensures emissions reductions by decreasing the overall cap that all um, of all emissions in, in the system. However, for the system to work properly, it's extremely important that we prevent non-compliance, since only non-compliance by, by a few actors can have drastic implications for the system as a whole. And the regulator for the EUTS has put in place a set of measures that we call the compliance cycle to prevent non-compliance from happening. And this compliance cycle is based on self-monitoring and reporting by operators of installations and third-party verification. That means throughout the year, 
um, the operators need to monitor the emissions themselves and record them in an emissions report. And this emissions report needs then to be verified by a private third party, which we call the verifier. However, as nice as this system seems, there's also some problems. Um, there's a potential conflict of interest inherent to the system because operators pay the verifiers for the service that they deliver for verifying the emissions report. And that means that verifiers might be inclined to, well, look the other way when they find uh, some incongruencies in the uh, inaccuracies in the emissions reports. The verifiers compete with each other for verification contracts and want to be contracted next year again. The public may play a complementary role in this system um, by assuming what, yeah, you could say a watchdog role by checking compliance of these operators and verifiers to identify instances of non-compliance. However, in order to do that, it, it's extremely important that the public has access to the relevant information, information that allows checking compliance. And this is where the AUS Convention and the Environmental Information Directive come into play. They set out that public authorities must provide information upon request by a member of the public. And here it's important that three conditions must be fulfilled. First, the information in question must be environmental information. Second, the entity that holds the information must be a public authority. And finally, none of the grounds of refusal that are set out in the law may apply. So this scenario that I was just describing led me to my research question. To what extent and in which circumstances must environmental information related to compliance and non-compliance with the EUTS that is held by governmental authorities and or private verifiers be provided to the public upon request? And to what extent do governmental authorities and private verifiers provide such information in practice? I answered this research question by three parts uh, of my thesis, a doctrinal, a comparative, and an empirical part. As you can see here on the slide, the doctrinal and comparative parts answer the first part of the main research question, which you saw on the slide, on, on top of the slide before. And the second part of the research question that you saw on the bottom of the previous slide uh, is answered by the empirical part. The doctrinal part comprises consists of three chapters. In chapter two, the AUS, I analyzed the AUS Convention and the Environmental Information Directive in order to identify and define the three central concepts that I was talking about before, environmental information, public authorities, and the grounds of refusal. In chapter three, I looked at the EU emissions trading system and the compliance cycle in order to understand it properly and to identify those information that would be necessary for checking compliance with the EUTS. In chapter four, then, I combined the insights of the two preceding chapters and analyzed whether, according to the Access to Environmental Information Directive, the relevant information that I identified must be disclosed according to the Environmental Information Directive. Then in chapter five, which is the comparative chapter, I look at German and English law that uh, implements the right to environmental information in these national jurisdictions. And here I focus on the particularities of, the two, of these two systems in order to see whether these particularities somehow influence or change the, um, the conclusions that I drew in, in chapter four. And finally, uh, in the empirical chapter, I tried to test my, uh, empirical, uh, my, my theoretical findings from the, the, from the preceding chapters in practice by sending out requests for the relevant information myself. And I will talk a little bit about what I found uh, in, in a minute. But first, I want to focus on the more theoretical findings of my research. With regard to the concept of environmental information, so the first condition I was talking about earlier, I found that it's extremely broad, actually so broad that all the information that I identified as relevant comes within that definition. So the first condition for accessing the relevant information is fulfilled. 
With regards to the definition of public authorities, I also found that it's quite a broad definition. It includes traditional governmental authorities like ministries, governments, town halls, and, and so on. But under certain conditions, it also includes private parties. One of these circumstances is that where a private party performs a public service that relates to the environment and this private party is under the control of another public authority. So for me, the question was, is the private verifier such a public authority? Does it come within this definition? And it was easy to find that the verifier performs a public service that relates to the environment because the verifier, as I was explaining earlier, takes such a prominent role in the enforcement of the EUTS. So enforcement being a public service, a public task, and because it's environmental law, it's, it relates to the environment. The more tricky question was whether the verifier is under the control of another public authority. In my thesis, I argue that this is the case, so that the verifier is under the control of another public authority, because the verifier is subject to a particularly tight system of rules, so uh, much so that it's actually not able to determine in a generally autonomous matter how it performs the service that is outsourced to it. So the condition, the second condition I was mentioning earlier is also fulfilled. With regards to the grounds of refusal, I found that it's not possible to determine in an abstract way whether any of the grants of refusal mandate refusing access to the relevant information. Um, but on the other hand, it also, um, or why this is not possible, is that you, in order to make that assessment, you would actually need to have the information. So instead, um, this, would, this assessment would be necessarily be made by public authorities when they receive a request on a case-by-case -case basis. So it really depends on the individual case. But we cannot generally say that access to the relevant information should be uh, refused based on one of the grants of refusal. So the third condition is at least is, is also fulfilled. So in principle, we should get access to the relevant information. So then I went to, to test this finding in, in practice. I sent out requests to governmental authorities and verifiers in Germany and the United Kingdom. Um, I sent out these requests regarding to 24 installations in total. 12 of those installations were located in Germany and 12 in the United Kingdom. With regards to the requests to governmental authorities, um, these were generally quite successful in terms of getting the information. I found that the public authorities generally regard the information that I identified as relevant for checking compliance as uh, environmental information. And consequently, they also provided most of the information to me. There were a few exceptions uh, since some of the uh, public authorities refused, or the governmental authorities, I should say, refused access by referring to one of the grants of refusal. Obtaining the relevant information from the verifier was much more difficult and less successful from, from the point of view of getting the information, since verifiers argued that they are not public authorities and consequently were not under an obligation to actually give me the information. The main argument that they provided was that they are not under the control of a public authority. Some of them also said that their tasks did not relate to the environment. So this argument by the verifier also kind of matches my, my finding in the previous, that I showed on the previous slide, that it's kind of difficult to, to actually determine whether the verifier is under the control of a public authority. And obviously that makes it hard in practice to getting the information. So to draw some general conclusions from my experience and from my research, even though it was hard to get some of the information from that was held by the verifier, I still think that we can say that the right to access environmental information can be a very powerful tool because it allows us to get a lot of the information that I identified as relevant from public authorities, which is already a lot. And with regard to uh, the definition of public authority, I think we can say that the broad wording is somewhat of a double-edged sword. On the one hand, the fact that it is so broad 
allows us to potentially include a lot of different actors. So it provides flexibility to us or to, to the law. However, on the other hand, this the fact that it's so broad, the definition also gives rise to some uncertainty. And this uncertainty allows actors such as the EUTS verifier in my case to argue that it's not a public authority because it's, for instance, not under the control of another public authority. And entities that do not recognize that they are public authorities yeah, are in practice a barrier to using this right effectively, for example, for accessing compliance related information. And this is particu particularly relevant in the context of outsourcing public tasks to private entities that I was mentioning earlier. So in that sense, I think we, uh, it's very important that the EU legislator should set out clearly whether access to environmental information laws apply to such private entities from a transparency perspective and from the perspective of yeah, getting access to information. It would of course be desirable yeah, that the legislator decides that public, these such private authorities, private entities are uh, public authorities. Um, and coming back to the uh, this outsourcing task, this is particularly relevant if uh, considering that it's not only happening in the EUETS, so not only the EUETS verifiers um, yeah, are a contentious issue, but if we look at other areas of environmental law, such as the regulation of maritime emissions, the corporate sustainability and due diligence directive that it's currently be being discussed, and the regulation of sustainable biofuels. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation. The opposition will be opened by Professor Eli Antonio. Professor Eli Antonio is Professor of European and Comparative Administrative Law and Procedure at our university, and she is also the chair of the assessment committee. Thank you very much. Dear candidates, well, first of all, my warmest congratulations for having written such a clear, engaging and enriching thesis. I especially want to congratulate you for your clear writing style, particularly because you examine such a complex and uh, technical topic. Um, besides the compliments, my question for you uh, today concerns the notion of public authority, which has been also at the center of your presentation, um, and especially the notion of public authority under the Aros Convention. Um, you conclude uh, in your thesis that uh, while there are some arguments for um, concluding that uh, verifiers under the ETS systems can be considered as public authorities, that is not yet certain. It cannot be established with uh, certain. So it is not certain that the text of uh, uh, the Access to Information Directive, as it is currently formulated, includes also verifiers. So my question uh, for you today, it's um, simple, although maybe not easy. And um, I would like to hear from you um, some thoughts on how, in your opinion, an amendment to the text of the directive should look like uh, in order to encompass uh, clearly also verifiers under the ETS directive, but also possibly under the other uh, secondary law instruments, which you have just mentioned in your presentation. Thank you. Highly esteemed proponent, thank you very much uh, for your kind words about my, my thesis and thank you very much for uh, your question. Um, it is indeed uh, a very intriguing question. And as you can see from my, my presentation, it's also really at the core of, of my thesis. Um, so as you, as you rightly say, I, in my thesis, I, I look at the uh, definition of public authorities as it's set out in the AUS Convention the environmental information and the environmental information directive. And I, I analyze, well, what does, whether this definition um, lets us conclude whether the UTS verifier is a public authority or not. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question to answer because as you say, uh, it, it's not really possible based on this broad definition of uh, public authorities. Uh, yeah, we cannot really give a clear answer to this question. So in terms of amendments um, or yeah, changes to the legislation, there are, I think, a few things that could be done. Um, for example, if we look at the definition, 
um, I emphasize this element of control. Um, so and this is, in my opinion, really the, yeah, the crucial point, because as I was saying, it's quite clear or easy to argue that the verifiers activities relate to or are public uh, tasks that relate to the environment since they are uh, yeah, involved in the enforcement of environmental legislation. So I think if uh, we are in terms of amendments, I think these should for sure focus on the element of control. If you look at the example, at least of the UTS verifier. And there, um, there we have only a few judgments of the CJEU. And one interesting judgment is uh, the court's judgments in the case Fish Legal, uh, which, yeah, exactly looked at this question. Um, in, in that case, it was, there were water companies uh, and the question was, well, are these public authorities or not? And there, the, the question, um, yeah, of, of the element of control also arose. And there the court did something quite interesting, which I also used in my in my uh, in my thesis and in my, in my argumentation and i also mentioned it now in the in the presentation the court said this element of control so the the requirement that the entity the private entity needs to be subject to the control of another public authority can also be the case even if there's no direct control but also if this entity in question is subject to a particularly tight legal or system of rules uh, so much so that it doesn't allow this entity to determine in an independent manner um, how to how to perform the task that that is outsourced to it, and I think this is really where um, yeah amendments uh, or clarification is necessary. So this element of control and the then following on, on that the yeah the the court's uh, assessment of this particularly tight legal system, because while the court explains this, it doesn't say well, what is such a particularly tight legal system? And I think this is, yeah, one of the, the issues that, um, yeah, would be really, if we clarify, if that was clarified either by a legislative amendment or by another court ruling that really dives into detail, well, what is actually a particularly tight legal system? Because the, the court does not say this. Um, so my, my answer to the question then would be, this is something that should be clarified. What, what is a particularly tight system of rules? And if we clarify that, I think it would be much clearer whether the verifier is under the uh, control of another public authority within the meaning of the AUS Convention and the Environmental Information Directive. Are you satisfied with the answer? In that, in that case, the opposition will be continued by Professor Lafreysen. Professor Lafreysen is Emeritus Professor of Environmental Law at the University of Ghent and also the President of the Constitutional Court of Belgium. And he's also a member of the Assessment Committee. And I would very much like to welcome Professor Lafreysen to Maastricht. He is joining us online uh, for this academic ceremony. Professor Lafreysen, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Chair. And I would also like to start with congratulating the PhD candidate with uh, the written work we had the opportunity uh, to, to read. Uh, I think the dissertation contains an in-depth and thorough analysis of international, European Union and domestic, and in this case, German and UK uh, access to environmental information law in relation to the compliance with the European Union ETS. Although the legal regime concerning public uh, access to ETS verification documentation has been clarified in the dissertation, and in my view, in a very convincing way, practice shows that the message has not reached most verifiers yet. And in reality, smooth access to compliance information held by them is a rare exception. So my question would be, could it be apart from the suggestions you have done and you have uh, also uh, clarified in response to the, 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 uh, the question of Professor Eliantonio. Uh, so my question 
would be that apart from those suggestions, a solution to uh, amend the European Union ETS legislation in that sense that verifiers should communicate, for example, every year, the relevant compliance information to the national competent authority would be a solution. So there cannot be any more a discussion that then the information held by uh, the competent uh, authority is within the scope of uh, the access to information uh, legislation. So my question would be, would such an amendment, so just saying the compliance information by verifiers should be communicated, for example, every year to the competent uh, authority, would that solve the problem? or not, or maybe uh, it could be problematic from, from other uh, uh, perspectives. So I would like to, to hear uh, your feelings uh, about uh, uh, such a, a solution. Uh, thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question. And also thank you uh, very much for your kind words about my thesis. Um, it's, it's a very intriguing question, I have to say. Um, so if I understand you correctly, you are asking whether it to, well, to the problem that, that I describe in my thesis that we cannot get access to the information that is held by the private verifiers, would it be a solution to this problem that we require verifiers to submit every year this compliance related to information to the competent national authority that is responsible for administering uh, the, the EUTS. Um, so I have a, I have a few uh, thoughts on this. Um, so first of all, I, I would like to come back to the initial problem of that, that gave rise to, to me actually in yeah, looking into this topic. So um, we're, we're wondering, or as I explained in the beginning of my, my presentation, I was wondering, well, we have this, this compliance cycle with uh, yeah, self-monitoring and reporting and private uh, verification. And there seems to be somewhat of a conflict of interest, at least, uh, that gives rise to some concerns. And yeah, my basic assumption was that if this is information accessible, we can to a certain extent uh, remedy this concern um, by either accessing the information and exposing non-compliance if there is some, or maybe even by the fact that it is accessible, we can already prevent non-compliance because the yeah, industries involved, the operators and verifiers, they are concerned that they might be exposed. So sometimes even the, the threat of exposure might be enough. So coming back to uh, your question, uh, would, or you, your, your suggestion, let's say, if we change the system as you propose, that verifiers would need to submit the, the information at the end of the year to the public authorities, I think, um, well, this would already kind of solve or maybe go in the same direction because submitting the, the relevant information to the public authority could at least have a similar effect because verifiers and operators might be afraid, well, if this information is going to the competent national authority, they might take a closer look. They, they already might see if we are doing something we're not supposed to do. So this effect the, that, well, I think that uh, the effect that I think um, accessing the information could have would already be achieved at least to a certain extent or could be achieved. Um, but on top of that, as you say, if this information um, that is now at the moment only held by the verifier would be then held by the public authority at the national level. This would also mean that because it's in the hands of a public authority, the information in principle at least must be disclosed to the public when the public asks, asks for it. Because as I've shown in my, uh, my presentation and also my thesis, the information is environmental information. That's pretty clear and the competent governmental authorities at the national level are also clearly public authorities. So unless one of the grounds of refusal applies, it should be accessible. 
So in that sense, I think what you propose is, is quite an elegant solution um, to the problem that, that we invest that, that we see here. I hope this answers your question. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Then the opposition will be continued by Professor De Witte. Professor De Witte is Professor of European Union Law at our university and also a member of the assessment committee. Professor De Witte is uh, also joining us online for this ceremony. Happy to give you the floor. Thank you, Prorector. And uh, can you hear me distinctly in the room? Thanks. Yes, we so, can. I regret that I cannot be physically present in, in Maastricht for your defense. Um, to congratulate you for your thesis, dear candidate. Um, it's it's an, an, I think, an excellent thesis. The, the, um, the research question is clearly formulated. The structure is convincing. And the writing is not just about transparency, but the writing itself is quite transparent. As has already been said by others, you, you write very clearly, it's easy to follow the reasoning. And therefore also, one tends to be convinced by your reasoning. Now, if you allow me, I will switch for a moment from questions about the substance of your thesis to a question about the methodology of your thesis. As you indicate in the thesis, and also again this afternoon, you use three different methods in, in, in your work. So the doctrinal, comparative, and empirical. Now, I understand the difference between the doctrinal and the empirical. And I think, in fact, that the empirical part has, been, has made a useful contribution to, to your findings. What I don't understand so well is the distinction you make between the doctrinal and the comparative method. Now, to me, it would seem that what you do in the first three chapters is to examine EU law, the, the relevant rules of European Union law, through a doctrinal method. And what you do in chapter four is to examine the practice, the implementation of those rules in two states, in Germany and the United Kingdom. But that, again, seems to be a doctrinal study. So, could you explain to me what the difference is between the doctrinal and the comparative method? Uh, to me, it seems, at least in the framework of your thesis, that the comparative method is actually the doctrinal method, but applied to another object than the EU law, namely to the national legal systems. So could you elaborate a little bit on the distinction that you apparently see between these two different methods? Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your question and thank you very much uh, for your kind words about my thesis. So if I understand you correctly, you are wondering about my methodology and uh, more specifically how uh, the doctrinal uh, part of my thesis is, uh, is different from my comparative part and why I, I call it the comparative part. So um, when, when starting this, this research uh, and coming up with the methodology, uh, it was quite, quite clear for me from, from the start that I wanted to have, um, well, a, let's say more traditional black letter analysis um, and an empirical part. So I, I would look at the, at the law as it is in the books and I would look at the law, how it is actually applied in practice because I think it's, it's very important, especially in environmental law, um, where it's often not so much done to see how is the law applied in practice. And to, yeah, to come to your, to your question, so when, when designing my, my research methodology, um, I, I looked at, to, because maybe to give you a little bit of background, I'm, uh, I have a political science background, and I looked, okay, what, what is comparative law? Um, and I, I read a lot about it to, to see, well, to, to capture kind of, yeah, what, what, what am I dealing with? And 
for me, the essence uh, of comparative law, as I understood it, was always to look at different legal systems and how these systems, yeah, take a similar, uh, the same problem, what solutions they develop to this problem. And based on this com comparing these, these different solutions and what we can learn about these different legal systems based on this analysis. And this is exactly then what I, what I set out to, to do after writing the doctrinal part of my research, where, uh, as you say, I look at, the, at EU law and international law. I look at how, um, as I was explaining in my presentation, what, is, what are the main elements of the environmental, uh, the right to access env environmental information, namely, as I say, in the concept of environmental information, public authorities and the, the, the grounds of refusal. Um, and after having set out these main elements of this right, and also a few other minor issues that, as you know, I, I've described in my book, I was wondering, okay, we have these broad guidelines. Now I would like to see how, yeah, two different national legal systems deal with these, yeah, uh, provisions and how are they implemented international law and how are they different and what does this uh, then tell us about these different national legal systems um, and uh, what can we learn from this for well then moving on to my empirical part so you could maybe say that my comparative part is not um, yeah, traditional in the sense of uh, yeah, applying a, the, the functional method of comparative law. But nonetheless, I think it is still adequate to call it comparative research, because as I said uh, at the beginning of my answer, for me, comparative law is to look at how different legal systems deal with the same problem or deal with the same issue. And based on that, what we can learn from this. I hope this answers your question. Can I, can I follow up? Yes. Um, yes, I, I understand that. And, and I think, I, of course, I agree with you that there is a comparative method, namely looking at, at different legal orders and then you know, explaining the differences and similarities that you find between them. Um, what I don't quite understand is why this, your study of UK and German law is not doctrinal. Okay, so my point is, is not that you don't do comparison properly. I think you do it well in, in those chapters. But why is this not doctrinal? Because in, in, in the presentation of your methodology, you say, I do doctrinal in the first three chapters, and then I do something else, namely comparative. Now, to me, it doesn't seem so different what you do in chapter four. You do the same kind of legal analysis uh, in, a different, you know, in a different legal system. And you use comparative methodology on top of it, but it's not non-doctrinal, at least in, in, from my perspective. So what, what's your feeling about that? Thank you for, for the follow-up question, highly esteemed opponent. Um, well, you know, just to clarify, so you, you, you're wondering why I, again, why I call this part the, the comparative part, even though my, my methods or what I do is, is somewhat doctrinal. Um, but yeah, I, as I was saying, it, it is not only do, doctrinal in, in, in the yeah, traditional sense. The doctrinal part, I, I call it the comparative part because it's yeah, a comparison of how Germany and the United Kingdom have, have implemented the, the same provisions that I analyzed previously in the doctrinal part. I compare how um, they have implemented certain elements of the right to, to access environmental information. Uh, and in that sense, I, I think it, it makes sense to call this chapter uh, com the comparative part or the comparative chapter of my, of my thesis, because I, yeah, as I was saying earlier, for me, what I, as, I, as I understand comparative law is about yeah, comparing how two legal systems deal with similar issues. And this is exactly what I do in this chapter. 
So that's why I, I call it the comparative part. And of course, some elements might be doctrinal because I, I look at the law, I interpret the law, um, but I still think it's adequate to call it comparative because I, I really yeah, compare the two systems and based on this comparison, see yeah, what, what, what we can learn from that and what it means for the, the application of, yeah, of, of the right to access environmental information um, as a whole and in, in practice later. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Rompane. Dr. Rompane is senior lecturer in international environmental law at the University of Eastern Finland and also a member of the assessment committee. And I would like to welcome her also very much to Maastricht University today. You have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Muller, uh, thank you for the presentation and the uh, answers provided so far. Um, your uh, doctoral thesis is a clear and coherent whole uh, that approaches these questions very systematically. Thesis is a, a very pleasant to read. Major part of your thesis could be described as a traditional uh, legal dogmatics, uh, dogmatics that is poised up with the particular methodological choices you have made. Um, in your research uh, approach, you restate your research questions several times and return to discuss the same questions from different angles and perspectives by deepening the systematization uh, with each new approach. While this um, adds clarity and coherence, uh, this also results in some repetition. In my view, uh, some of this space uh, could have been used to develop and elaborate on the broader, more theoretical framework for the thesis, especially as the thesis also identifies a valuable set of key concepts supporting the substantive analysis. Hence, uh, my question relates to the theoretical context of the thesis. I'm interested of hearing your brief reflections on, on what do you consider is the broader scholarly context and research tradition to which this doctoral thesis contributes to and how. In other words, uh, what is the key contribution this thesis makes to existing legal scholarship in the field beyond its substantive contribution? Thanks. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words about my, my book and thank you very much for the question. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you're wondering about, yeah, let's say my choice to focus more on, um, yeah, the, the practical part and why I did not, um, yeah, include a more broader theoretical discussion of the, the related field or of the fields that my, my thesis relates to. Um, it's, it's, it's an intriguing question and thank you very much. So maybe first to to come to my choice, why why I chose this approach uh, that you you said. So why did I focus so much on the, describing the law and then seeing how it is applied in practice? Uh, as I was already briefly mentioning earlier in one of the other questions, I feel that in environmental law, especially, but probably also in other areas of the law. There is uh, a lot of focus on well, understanding the law, reading the law, analyzing the law, you know, setting it in into a broader framework. Um, but the the practical application is often overlooked, and this is why I focused on on this part uh, in particular. And this is why I made this choice because, especially if you look at if we take the, what I'm looking at here, the right to access environmental information. It's a right given to the public, given to, to everyone, um, individuals, NGOs, companies, and so on. And it's meant to be used in practice. So I think it's extremely relevant to yeah, see, well, what, what is this law? What's, what, what, what is this right? What are the elements of the right? That's very necessary. And we can have interesting discussions about what, what are the broader theoretical underpinnings but it's extremely relevant also to see how is this law applied in practice? How is this used? How can we use this in practice? And of course, um, that is not to say that more theoretical questions are not relevant at all. That's not what I'm saying. Um, I chose to, to focus on this 
because I think it's extremely important to focus on the practical, practical implication and this hadn't been done so far to that ex to this extent at least. But of course there are, as you correctly say, um, some, some broader theoretical discussions to which my thesis relates. And I think one of them uh, is actually quite related to what I was just saying, the, the enforcement to, to the practical application and enforcement of law. So um, as, I have, as, have, as I have demonstrated in my thesis, you know, it, it is about enforcement of law. And I think enforcement of law is, is yeah, also a, a broader discussion to which my thesis can, can contribute uh, at least a little bit because we can see that um, yeah, the enforcement of law is, is not um, only, cannot only be carried out by, well, what we usually associate it with. It can be carried out by private authorities that are not the traditional governmental authorities who usually enforce uh, legislation, but also by the public, uh, as I have demonstrated in my empirical part. So the, the enforcement of law and how, uh, how it is, how it is done um, is, is one of the areas where my, my thesis can, can certainly contribute because it kind of stimulates a debate to maybe yeah, broaden the horizon a little bit and, and think about alternative methods of enforcement of, of environmental legislation. And then uh, maybe another issue uh, to, to, of a yeah, theoretical debate to which my, my thesis can contribute is um, yeah, the, the more the, the, the discussion of outsourcing of private tasks um, and to, to public uh, to, to uh, of public tasks to private entities, excuse me. Um, because as I've, I've shown, you know, my example is the EUTS and um, I discussed this extensively, but as I've said in my, uh, in my presentation uh, and also in my, in, my, uh, in my book, this is not the only area where we see this. This is actually quite common nowadays. Um, and yeah, maybe one example here, it's still on the slide, the Corporate Sustainability and Due Diligence Directive, which is, uh, yeah, it was proposed this year and will enter the legislative process in Parliament and Council after the summer. There, we have a very interesting, um, yeah, provision that gives the public, yeah, even more power, let's say. Um, it, it gives the public the right to um, submit a case not, not a legal case, but a complaint to the competent national authorities when they see that this legislation has been, or whether there, where there is a suspicion that this legislation is being violated. And then the public authority um, must investigate this issue. So, and, you know, coming back, so I think there, my thesis can also stimulate the debate to, of this, yeah, public and private uh, divide, let's say, um, what is a public authority and, and yeah, where, where should we draw, draw the lines and this outsourcing uh, of, of private, of public tasks to private authorities. Um, yeah, the discussion on, on these topics. I hope this answers your question. Um, you can. Thank you. Yeah. The opposition will now be continued by Dr. Abatsi, who is assistant professor of European law at our faculty and university. And he's also a member of the assessment. Committee. Thank you, Chair. Dear candidate, I join the congratulatory words of the other members of the assessment committee, and I applaud you for your research on this very valuable topic. The legal analysis you provide gives, gives depth, detail, and demonstrates your passion for the pursuit of transparency and accountability in EU environmental law, particularly the EU emissions trading system. Your thesis is characterized, as has already been discussed, by a somewhat narrow approach, which has some benefit. This narrow approach provides a linear understanding of access to information laws and serves as a useful mapping of these rules in the field, combining different norms, including here international regimes and relevant EU secondary roles, as well as national uh, rules and practices. You have somewhat a descriptive nature, which also provides clarity of the topic by assembling information and data, addressing an important gap in legal research. However, in your thesis, one only finds the theoretical foundation in between the lines. 
With my question, I would like to invite you to reflect on the analytical potential of your thesis, which I quite see in many fold. So in my first question, I specifically would like to address your reflections, and you have this scattered in different chapters, but particularly we see it in, uh, let's say, page 375, where you are discussing the relation between public knowledge and technical expertise. However, instead of developing this further, we don't really get the exploration of the complex interrelations between the law, public knowledge, and technical expertise. I would like to invite you in your response to reflect a bit further, how does your thesis enhance or enrich our understanding, in particular relevant academic debates, on the difficult relation between, on the one hand, public access to information and transparency, and on the other hand, the difficulties of technical expertise, especially in the times of heightened contestation against experts. Uh, I will leave it at that for my first question. Thank you. Esteemed opponent, thank you very much for your kind words and for your question. Uh, if I understand you correctly, you are, or you would like me to reflect a little bit on, um, yeah, the, the difficulties and um, yeah, challenges of, of transparency and the, the right of accessing information, yeah, in my case, environmental information on the one hand, and um, the, the challenges with this, with these concepts on the one hand with uh, yeah, technical expertise uh, on, on the other. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's indeed um, a very relevant aspect of the right to access envi to environmental information. Um, and I briefly also discussed this or touched upon this issue in my, in my introduction where I identify and discuss some of the benefits but also challenges of the right to access and to environment or to information in general uh, and transparency. And yeah, one of the big um, arguments against transparency or the drawbacks of transparency and public access to information uh, is always that the, the argument that the public, um, well, public access to environmental information is good, but does the public actually understand what they're accessing? So in, in, in that sense, um, yeah, that, is it even worth it giving out the information if, the person to whom we are giving the information doesn't really un uh, understand what what this information means. And obviously there, we can also be a bit concerned because information might be misinterpreted. You know, and once the information is out and is misinterpreted, then yeah, the, the snowball starts to get rolling and it might be very difficult to stop. However, um, I think that is not an argument um, from uh, to uh, against, um, access to environmental information or transparency in general, because uh, from, yeah, if we look at the, the, the moral underpinnings of the right to access uh, information in general and transparency, it's, it's a building block of democracy because, um, yeah, it, it, democracy is a, yeah, it's a representative system. And um, in order to, yeah, to have the proper checks and, uh, and balances on representation, the, um, the people who are being represented, they need to be properly informed. And access to information is one of the tools through which we can achieve this. Um, so in that sense, in a democracy, um, yeah, decisions being made behind closed doors and, or, and only being behind closed doors is absolutely not desirable. So um, in that sense, I think, yeah, this, this definitely uh, would yeah, warrant or support access to environmental information in this sense. And another issue is that um, we can say, of course, well, the public, if we look at an individual, um, when they ask for information or when they're given certain information, they might not be able to properly understand it. But I think if we talk about access to environmental information, we have to kind of, um, yeah, lose the, the, the thought that um, the of, of this particular individual, of the, the average person next door is asking for the information. Because as you correctly say, information can be quite complex. And I think this is also uh, something that I demonstrate in my thesis. If we talk about yeah, issues like the emissions trading system, 
it's ex information can be extremely complex and even for highly educated individuals it's some, sometimes very hard to understand what they inf and interpret the information and understand what it means however i think uh, we and coming back to what i said earlier we cannot assume then that just because of that we cannot give out the information or it, 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 this is something that we shouldn't strive for because in a, we should look at this uh, from a pers from the perspective of society at large, that we're giving out the information not to one individual that might not understand the information, but to, so to society at large. And if if we look at it from this perspective, we have very qualified entities within society to interpret into information, to put it in the right context, and to explain it to some other members of the society um, that might not be understand be able to understand it by themselves. For example, um, we have yeah, loads of NGOs, if you look at the environmental sector, loads of NGOs that are active in this field and that can take um, yeah, a, a role and represent society in that sense. Or if we look at journalists, you know, journalists, they specialize in a certain field and they might be able to interpret certain information. So I think when we talk about the challenges of the right to access environmental information and the problems that uh, with the yeah, degree of complexity of information and yeah the, the the lack of technical expertise let's say i think we have to yeah move away from looking at one individual that might get the information but more at the public at large and what the public at large might do or can do with this this information okay the opposition will be continued by Professor Voss, who is Professor of European Law at our university. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, dear candidate, um, I would also like to join my colleagues uh, in congratulating with uh, writing this wonderful book and doing all this uh, very interesting research. My general question is, is, does the access to information lead to more participation? or rather more normative, do you think that access to information should lead to more participation? As based on the information that one would obtain, this could lead to more knowledge and hence increase participation. One could hereby think of the, of in particular, the example of the greenhouse gas permit um, and the decision ma making procedure leading towards the granting or the refusal of the permit. So in other words, what compliance information is relevant for citizens, so relating to the, the last question, and NGOs to participate meaningfully to the greenhouse uh, gas uh, permit procedure? Thank you. Highly esteemed opponent, thank you very much uh, for your question and for your kind words about my work. Um, so I'm uh, going to focus on the last part of, of your question because I think it's a it's a, a very, very uh, intriguing question. So what compliance information is uh, relevant for the public to participate in the greenhouse gas permit uh, procedure in the permitting procedure? So. Actually, I when in my thesis, I in my in the, in the second in the third chapter where I looked at the EU ETS, uh, I also yeah did a detailed analysis on what information does the public actually need to well check compliance uh, with the EU ETS uh, on part of the operators and, and verifiers, and one of the elements that I identified um, as as being relevant was also the greenhouse gas permit, so. Um, and if we then look what information would the public need um, to participate in in the in the permitting procedure, I think we have to um, yeah take a step back um, and actually see what what you were also asking. Does more information lead to more participation? So if we get all the information we want or if the public gets all the information that it wants or yeah, could access in theory, would this actually lead to more participation? So yeah, on another level, is, yeah, 
is more access to information does it actually achieve the aim let's say of 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 yeah of the right to access to environmental information so in that sense i think um the the aim of access to environmental information is is not only to to achieve more uh, participation or to uh, yeah to give the, out the information to the public itself you may briefly conclude your reply thank you um so we can look at the aim of the right to access to environmental information from a lot of different perspectives and it's not only achieving more participation um but it it is also you could say a yeah a transparency representing here the right to access to environmental information is uh, a goal in itself or a value in itself as i was saying earlier within a democracy um yeah transparency is is really crucial yeah i think i leave it as that and maybe we can discuss this at another point dear candidate the time appointed for defending your thesis has passed the degree committee will now after all to discuss the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense and i request that you and your company both here and online await the results of our deliberations and our return in this room
Matthias Müller. The degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and the quality of your defense. In view of its positive verdict and taken into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Professor, Professor Fowler is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch university custom. And I'll invite your supervisor to take the floor. Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible. I promise. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I confer upon you, Matthias Nicolaus Müller, the degree of doctor and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the rector, the secretary and the other members of the committee and affixed with the official seal of the university. Dear Dr. Müller, dear Matthias, it is with great pleasure to address you as a doctor right now, which I do also on behalf of Michael Farr. This achievement of having obtained the PhD degree could only be realized with great motivation and hard work, and you have showed both. The motivation for the thesis topic was already born during your law master, which you followed here at Maastricht University. We took the course European Environmental Law, and that is how we met. You decided to develop a master thesis on a topic that, although extremely important, remains largely overlooked in legal literature. And I'm talking about the trustworthiness of the compliance cycle of the European Emissions Trading Scheme, a core instrument of EU climate law. After completing the master thesis on this topic, you became enthusiastic to embark on a PhD even without funding, so without a salary. You took the decision to start Extra Muros, combined with a part-time job as an assistant taking care of children at a primary school, working half days there, so um, taking care of the young children, playing games with them, ensuring they took lunch properly, and you combine that with developing academic research. At that time, also because of this childcare job, you decided to stay in Cologne and to work from there. Actually, this combination of practical work and research worked very well. From this unique position, you developed the research proposal further and submitted it to the annual PhD competition round provided by our law faculty. The fact that you won the law faculty competition 
was already a major achievement given the tough competition. I do remember that the feedback was that you did perform very calm and well during the interview, staying to the points, and of course, also having a solid proposal with the three pillars present, doctrinal, comparative, and empirical. From then on, you became an official PhD student with a salary. In this position, you not, you not only worked on the research, but also tried to help to build a nice PhD community, organizing social events among your peers. You also then decided to move to Maastricht for very important personal reasons. Together with Madeleine, you were in the heart of a vibrant PhD community in Maastricht. Yeah, Matthias, I have a little bit uh, the idea that the social events were extremely necessary to cope with the more technical, legal part of the research. The stamina you showed to develop this thesis step by step, changing the structure time and again, is to be applauded. I even have got the impression that you started to like the traditional legal research very much. <laughs> But you can also be very happy with the empirical research, which is a kind of experiment. Actually, in your master thesis, you already carried out an empirical survey, which already led to surprising findings, such as the fact that according to a German authority, the acquired information through access to information requests was not meant to be used for academic research. Well, you have done so now in your PhD research. To my best knowledge, your thesis is the first one in Europe that is dedicated to the trustworthiness of the score and crucial instrument of EU climate law. The fact that your PhD on this topic appears almost exactly 30 years after I defended my PhD on the emissions trading scheme means a lot to me. And you informed me this afternoon that 30 years ago was your year of birth. Yeah. It's everything very special, I think. Moreover, your PhD is very valuable, particularly because of an, if an ENGO, an environmental organization, is willing to try the courts in case verifiers refuse to disclose information, your PhD can and should be used for supporting the claim in the court. Dear Matthias, we as, supervised, we as supervisors have experienced you as a solid researcher, being very steady, going step by step. Also working towards this defense, Michael and I were confident that you would perform well. You even called two weeks ago the PhD defense the big show, which I think is very courageous to call a PhD defense. But not only courage, also endurance was crucial for you to arrive at this special moment. We are very grateful, Matthias, that you kept on carrying out your research, also during COVID, working from beautiful Portugal, and that you have delivered this book. Dr. Matthias, you have embarked now on new experiences, first with the Transparency Office to the European Parliament, and now working with an organization representing businesses in Brussels. And I, and I already have heard how interesting and important the topics are you take care of now. Now you have left university, I will miss you as a colleague who also took care of teaching. It was very nice to teach together with you, the students. I wish you a bright future, and I believe that the academic development is a solid foundation to work on sensitive com and complicated problems in practice. Of course, you could not do all this work without support from others, and hence I also would like to include in the congratulations your family, and of course your fellow PhD colleague and love of your life, Mad Madeleine. And I would like to thank you all wholeheartedly for the support given to, given to Matthias. Matthias, you have deserved the, the degree you have obtained today. We are very grateful for the work you have done. And I would like to conclude with my herzliche Glückwünsche für Sie, Dr. Matthias. Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Yeah, dear Dr. Muller, also on behalf of the Board of Deans and the University and the Faculty of Law, many congratulations on the degree that you have just acquired. We know that you already had two, 
academic degrees from this university. And I always say this is the highest one we have available. You cannot go any <laughs> higher than it, than this one. Um, so many congratulations to you, also to your supervisors and to your uh, family and friends, and to, indeed to Madalena, Dr. Narciso, I should say. <laughs> um, uh, I really would like to thank also all the members of the committee, in particular also our members and guests from outside of uh, uh, Maastricht, Professor Lavreisen, who joined us online uh, today, uh, and Dr. Rompane. Many thanks for uh, joining us. Um, we are going to have, I can easily say that because uh, uh, you are the hoster, <laughs> going to have a reception that takes place right here in this, uh, uh, in this building. Um, um, and I would like to ask everyone who is present here in the Ola to also join us for that reception and to everyone who is watching the ceremony online to also toast to our new uh, young doctor. Um, we will still stay behind here in uh, here in the Ola for just a few more uh, minutes while you will go to the reception and we stay behind to take the traditional photo of the young doctor together with his paramimps, together with the committee um, here present, including our members online and also with uh, our uh, beetle. And with this, I close this academic ceremony. Yeah.